let you get everyone's attention. This is, oh, this is nice. I don't have to raise my voice. <laughs> Linda, are you, here we go, perfect. All right, uh, my, my name is Richard, and, and this, is, this is Linda. Linda, wait. Linda's going to say hi in a minute. She's going to take a picture of all of us. Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the Dutch Chocolate Shop. Uh, my wife, Kim Cooper, and I run Lava. Chinta, raise your hand. Lava, uh, Charlie approached Lava. Lava is a, a very, a, just a loose knit collection of visionaries, Los Angeles Visionaries Association, people that do interesting things in Los Angeles. This is a very interesting thing to do in Los Angeles right now. So we're very honored that Charlie, and I don't see Charlie. Linda's Charlie left for Long Beach. Charlie's all over. Charlie is ubiquitous. Um, we'll get to Charlie in a moment. Chinta, if uh, Chinta, pass out some flyers. I'm giving a bus tour next Saturday, History of Downtown, half price coupons in the flyer. Chinta's going to pass them out. We'd love to see you on the bus. Um, we do lots of interesting stuff about History Downtown. So when Charlie approached me and asked me if we'd do this event, I was so delighted. So we are in the interior of a shop that was opened in 1914. Uh, it was designed by Plummer and Field. We're gonna get into all of this. The tile is by Ernst Batchelder. And, uh, very good, very Batchelder. Good. And we're gonna get into all of this. Uh, Linda, do you wanna say a couple things? Cause you've got stuff coming up. So I've got this bus tour next Saturday. There's a flyer for in the flyer. I'd love to see everyone on it. Two for one coupon. Linda, you've got stuff coming up here at the shop. So let's, let's go. Hi, I just want to welcome, give a friendly, hearty, warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. It's an honor to be involved with this project and, uh, and long live the Dutch Chocolate Shop. Um, this is kind of the first formal and formal event that we're having here and I'm thrilled that we can host this tour. Uh, next Sunday from, that's June 3rd from 4 to 6, we're going to have one of what I hope will be a series of public discussions about Batchelder, about this space, about uh, the arts and crafts movement in general. And that's going to be, again, with Brian Kaiser and uh, Charles Cadet. So um, you can also go to the website Countdown to Batchelder, and I'm a public artist, I'm documenting the, uh, visually the, the progress and uh, other, other assorted things, and I'm putting it on the website, and you can check out the events, and you can sign up either here, but you can also go on the website and, be, and get signed up on developments here. So um, the, the, the plan is to reinstate this space to the original function, not the original function of the building, but the original 1914 function, uh, when Batchelder was commissioned to make the, this extraordinary space. Uh, and and get it back to a Dutch chocolate shop. So welcome and have some chocolate from the fountain. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. And just let me confirm, there's a, a nice lady, Carolyn, at the front that has a mailing list for you. Linda, there's the Car Carolyn. So just at the front, as you leave, Carolyn has a mailing list for the, all the events here that you're going to be hosting. Yeah, and you also count down to that very snappy uh, name countdown to batchelder.com. <laughs> Alright, and if you want uh, information about lava, Chinta, raise your hand. Okay, Chinta's got some flyers if you haven't got them. Alright, so let's get started. Uh, three people are now going to talk. I'm going to be one of them. Uh, Nathan and Brian both raise your hand. They're over here in the corner. We're going we're gonna to drill down. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about what we're standing in right now, how it's been for maybe the last 10 years, then Nathan's gonna jump back, he's gonna come jump back to 1914, he's gonna flip between 1914 and 1924. Uh, these are both very important years for this space and very important years for building in Los Angeles and an architect named Joseph Field, who was involved, who was uh, one of the architects for this space and then went on to do spaces like the Oviat and Bullock's Wilshire and just Give away all my stuff. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I want you to talk. And then Brian will just start to talk about the tile on the wall, which is why we're all here. So we're just, um, so very quickly, uh, we're in this space. Um, this Charlie, the visionary, who has uh, opened this space up until about two months ago, there were bays of uh, aluminum 
bays of, of roll down uh, gates and this was broken up into an arcade. This had been an arcade since about 1996. So you just had individual shops. Each of these bays very naturally lent lend, lend itself into being a shop. And uh, Charlie took all of that down. God bless him. Uh, most of, of what you're looking at, the tile uh, was cut, a lot of it was covered, which is why it's going to be okay because people moved into their shops and they put up plywood and particle board and just glued it into place. I'm not sure. They didn't, doesn't look like they drilled anything into the wall, so everything is good. This is an interesting stretch of the world where at Broadway and Sixth, Broadway is a really interesting neighborhood between about 2nd and 9th. You'll notice there are all these really beautiful buildings built between 1900 and 1930, and almost every building, like this building, is vacant from the second floor up. And this is a really interesting phenomenon that started happening in the 1980s where uh, landlords are getting so much ground rent for their ground floor spaces, because this, is a, this used to be much busier. During the week, this is a very crowded neighborhood. Even today, it's crowded. And so they just would ignore the upper spaces and the, uh, so there's a, a movement to bring Broadway back and to figure out how to get back into these historic spaces and activate them, which is why we're here. And this is why it's so exciting we're here. And so uh, this building has, this space has come out of a very long hibernation from about 1985, 86, when the last tenant, which was the Finney's Cafeteria, moved out. Finney's was here since 19, uh, the mid 1930s, and so, so this has been this has been just reopened, and I'm going to stop talking. And Nathan, I'm going to let you talk about 1914 and 1924, and these two great building booms that this city, the downtown, saw. And uh, Nathan is a dear friend of mine. Nathan's an architectural historian. Uh, we give walking tours. We have one at 1.30 today. They're all in that lava flyer. If you want to know more about Nathan, get the lava flyer. Nathan, thank you so much. And I like this microphone. <laughs> That's because it's Mr. Microphone. Yeah. I'll be back to pick you up later. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Nathan Marsak, and I'm just going to speak for about a minute because Brian Kaiser is the real star here today, and he's going to knock your socks off when he talks about uh, Batchelder. And about Batchelder, Batchelder is obviously like the superstar here, above and beyond us all. I mean, we love Batchelder. I bought my house because of its badass Batchelder fireplace. As soon as I saw that, I was like, yeah, so. Um, and we love the stole, aka the El Dorado, and all of its bachelor. Although there's a story there about whether it's well, that's not important. And the uh, and the ask me when I'm not on camera. And the Fine Arts Building, of course, the most sublime space in all of Los Angeles, if not the world. And um, but bachelor would not have been with us were it not were here were it not for, of course, uh, Plummer and Field, and the importance of Joseph uh, uh, Plummer. Of Joseph Feel could not have could not be understated um, because they were the ones that said, "Okay, Batchelder, do what you're going to do." Because they were these interior uh, designers who went on to morph into Joseph Feel and Bernard Paradis. And uh, the, the reason we sort of chose 1914, 1924, 1924 is very important because well, we sort of chose that as a good decade marker because, of course, at that point the chocolate shop was basically completely forgotten. But at the same time. Los Angeles was experienced. Los Angeles basically like the richest city in the world at the time. Biggest oil. Not only, you know, we all talk about the oranges and the, and the movie industry at the time, but of course, we were supplying like one quarter to one third of the world's oil at the time. So Los Angeles was everything. And Feel and Parodies, of course, go on to do a little thing called the, oh, I don't know, Bullets Wilshire. You might have heard of it. You might have been inside of it. And if anyone knows the Oviat building, that's them too. Um, and Desmond's Wilshire, Silverwoods. Um, if you've ever been in any of the Bonwit Tellers in New York City, those are they. Um, and like so many others, including Batchelder, did not survive. The, well, who, su who survived the Depression? Um, but we'll be talking more about that on the Hill Street Walking Tour coming up at 1.30. I hope I'll see some of your faces then. And, um, and so that is what I have to say on that matter. I hope you found it elucidating. <laughs> but more importantly, Brian Kaiser, please come talk to us about But Richard wants to say this. I, I have a question that you don't have to answer immediately, but I hope at the end of your talk you will. We're talking about the Childers downtown, so there's the Stoll, 1912, Frederick Nonin, uh, 4th and Spring, that has Pachelder tile. You've got the Fine Arts Building at 7th and Flower, that's a 1920s. 
1924 Walker and Eisen structure, the entire interior two-story lobby is Bachelder. But the difference between the Bachelder tile, say for instance, in the Fine Arts Building and the Bachelder tile here is that the one in the Fine Arts Building was it just added the catalog. Yeah. Feel just went ahead and had an assistant go through the catalog and just pull stuff and then incorporate that into drawings. Whereas every almost everything you're about to walk us through today is custom tile. One of a kind. So this is Okay, I just wanted to just get that on, on the table immediately because that's a really important difference. And the Fine Arts Building is open today at 7th and Fall. They're open 9 to 5 every day. And the El Dorado, formerly the Stoll, you have to call. I don't know. They're, they're having some issues with being open. I don't know what they are, but they're just not open. Brian, thank you. I can't wait for you to tell us about this great tile. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Once again, my name is uh, Brian Kaiser. And the reason I'm here, um, I guess, as far as my history is concerned, I own the home of Rufus Keeler, who was the founder and manager of the Malibu Potteries out in Malibu, owned by the Ringe family. So uh, Mr. Keeler was making tile very close to the same years that Mr. Batchelder was making tile. So they were, I hope, friendly uh, competitors with each other, although the style they used was very, very different. Um, the man who should be here today really is Dr. Robert Winter from Pasadena, who is certainly one of the greatest architectural historians of Los Angeles and really spent his life studying Ernst Batchelder and writing the book. And uh, he's still with us, and his mind is as sharp as ever. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. But uh, I think he's around 90 years old, and really it's very hard for him to, to leave the house. So I'm really here in lieu of Dr. Winter, but I know what he knows what we're doing, and he's very excited about this uh, as well. Uh, there are many, many reasons this is a very important space. When I see things like this, especially here in downtown Los Angeles, I always think that we're standing in the middle of King Tut's tomb <laughs> because so many great lobbies, restaurants, so, you know, store locations in downtown LA, which had so much artistic elements and so much work went into them to make them unique and make the special happen, covered up one way or the other. False walls, you know, halls that are, that are covered off. Etc. 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 That it's astounding how things like that, as people are beginning to renovate these buildings, you tear down a false wall, and all of a sudden something like this is behind it. And this is kind of happening everywhere downtown. It's really very, very exciting. As um, as my friends already mentioned, this was covered up with false walls to create sort of a flea market for many, many years. And all you can barely see is maybe the top of the crest of some of the the tiles. Um, so thank God that Mr. Aslan has opened this up and is returning it to its uh, former glory. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, California, Los Angeles did not make tile. So people like the Green and Green Brothers in Pasadena when they built the, the Gamble House and other great houses or places like this, we had to import our tile from the East Coast. Green and Green used Gruby tile from Boston, some of the finest, very expensive tile in the United States. That had to import, be imported here or you actually got it from England or Germany or, or Spain or, or Italy, which means it all had to be imported at great cost from Europe. So in the early 1900s, Dr. Or, uh, Mr. Batchelder was working at Throop Polytechnique, which became Caltech, and he was interested not in tile originally, he was interested in the arts and crafts movement in general. So he kind of dabbled in a lot of different things, you know, woodworking and cabinet making and furniture making, and he started making tile. And just in his backyard, he had some small kills in the backyard at his home on the Arroyo. And uh, it proved to be very successful for a number of reasons. People loved the style. And also, it was a local, um, it was a local uh, availability of that tile. You didn't have to go to, to Boston. You didn't have to go to England, you know, to, to get it. So within two years, the neighbors were complaining that there was too much smoke and soot from the kills floating over top of their houses <laughs> all the time. So everybody was complaining to the city and complaining to Mr. Batchelder. So so in 1912, he bought a small uh, pottery, created a small potty, a pottery in Pasadena. And what's astounding is he'd only been in business two years in his own pottery, 1912 to 1914, when he was asked to do this commission. So for one thing, it was amazing that, that he did this so early on. But I think part of it was that, again, he was available locally. You didn't have to go to the, to the, uh, to the East Coast to have this done. Um, every single one of these murals, these great murals, I think there's about 20 here, every single one is custom made and, and handmade. They're not out of the catalog, there's no duplication. Yeah. This was the first job he did with his own proper studio, that's what you told me. I, I, I just want you to reiterate that. This is yeah, well the first major, yes. Yeah, he'd been in, new, and it's proper. And it was new pottery, yeah, he'd been in business about two years, but this was the first major, major, major installation that he got for anything like this. 
Uh, to sort of appreciate what it takes to do this is to do something on this scale. He uh, did a lot of research on, on Dutch daily life, you know, books and libraries and archives and what have you. And he chose the scenes or amalgamated them or brought them together. And then he had uh, an artist create what he called cartoons which is full-size images of what they wanted to create and just sort of an outline of the, of the images, just, you know, just black on white on white paper. Then the greenware tile, which is the tile when it's still wet, when it's still moist, just the bisque clay, but the wet clay is laid out on the floor, full-size on the floor of the studio, and the cartoon, the full-size image is laid down over the greenware. This is all just done on the floor. And then what they called a modeler or sculptor, a sculpting artist would come in and literally sculpt with that piece of that six by six piece of the cartoon laid down over each one of these tiles. He would carve, he would sculpt out every single tile to match the cartoon. So when all these designs <clears throat> were hand carved into each one of these tiles, then they went into the kills and they were fired. And um, and he put in a, um, a uh, not a glaze, that shadow tile is not glazed, but he put a finish in the recesses of the tile and then it was ready to go. A really important thing to sort of understand here, and even tile people don't always connect to this, but I've done a lot of tile uh, salvage and, and restoration in a lot of historic buildings. The dark, dark brown you're seeing here is not a glaze. Um, Batchelder tile is what's called engobe tile, and engobe tile basically means the tile is the bisque body of the tile itself. There is no glaze on top of it. It's very soft. It's very, very soft. One tile over here, later on you can come over and take a look, there's one six by six and the feet of a little girl have been cleaned back down to the original. And Gobi tile is like a sponge, it's very open. Without a glaze it would collect all the dust, all the dirt, especially in a space like this. They didn't have sealers like we have today, so they used shellac. So once the bad shelter tile went up, it was customary at the time to put shellac over top of that to protect it, but sadly enough, shellac goes bad, it just goes very bad. You take an old piece of furniture from the, you know, the late 1800s or so, it looks like it's been painted brown, and it hasn't, the shellac has gone bad. So you've got a shellac surface here, which was meant to protect the tile, but it's gone very dark, it's not a glaze. And then sometime between 1914, but before 1924, the Dutch chocolate shop, for reasons we can only speculate on, didn't think the murals were colorful enough. So they hired someone, and Dr. Winter thinks this is a possibility, they hired somebody from the Batchelder studio to come in here and hand paint all these, these murals. Because Batchelder tile is very, very subtle. The colors are only in the recesses. But here you can see everything is very, very colorful and very bright. That was added later on. That's not original. But to protect that layer of paint, the painter then had to put another coat of shellac over top of that to set it, you know, to set it and protect it. So there's an interesting question even now, and it's not up to me, as to how far back the restoration, you know, should go. And that is, that's just an honest question about how do you, you know, that you always find, how do you restart, restore something or how far do you go back? Um, just in general, that's, that's sort of, the main factors about this installation, and um, and again, just, just you know, in general, Mr. Batchelder was so important because he was the first really significant tile maker here in the Los Angeles area, where we started to get a locally made tile, and then ultimately produced in very, very large quantities. In 1920, he reincorporated and built a, a huge pottery, a huge, huge pottery in Los Angeles uh, proper, and he developed showrooms all, all in all the major cities of the United States and Canada. You find a lot of Batchelder tile in Canada as well from New York, you know, floor, all across the United States you find Batchelder Tile. Tremendously popular, very, very prolific and very, very successful until of course um, 1929 there was a, a, a crash. A lot of people don't realize there was a recovery from the stock market crash in 19. 29. It wasn't good, but there was a recovery. And a lot of businesses across the United States, Malibu and Calico, all these wonderful potteries, were hanging on kind of by their fingernails. But in 1932, there was a second crash. It was a double dip, which I hate to even mention, but there it was. So a lot of businesses held on after 29, but by 32, they were operating on such a razor's edge that when the second crash came in 32, Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses across the United States just declared bankruptcy and went out of business. So in 32, Batchelder declared bankruptcy, Malibu, Calco, um, so many of the great tile makers of that era that it, it profited from this, this incredible architectural boom in Los Angeles all failed. 
and uh, all went out of business. Gladding the Beans survived and they survived today and because they were so big they went out and bought out, they, they bought all these other businesses in bankruptcy. Some they maintained and some they just took the machinery and closed down the buildings uh, because uh, people couldn't afford this, this kind of tile anymore once the depression struck and styles changed of course you know very much the deco and the modern was starting to uh, starting to come in. Um, so uh, uh, most everybody's still awake at this point, which I'm really I'm grateful for. So, uh, any any questions, maybe, that I might be able to answer while I'm here? Yes. Yeah. Number one, who owns the building and is doing the restoration? And number two, what's going to happen to the space? Well, they're trying to restore it back to this, the original concept of the Dutch chocolate shop. There's a family by the name of uh, Aslan that's owned this building for many, many, many years, and uh, it's now in the. Um, I believe there was an aunt and uncle who. Are, are not managing anymore. So there's a Mr. Uh, Charles Aslan who's in charge of this now and owns the building. He's not. He's not. He was here earlier, but he's not here uh, today. I don't know if I, I thought he. I'm not sure if he's here or not. But but they're the family that's owned this for many years, and uh, because it it, it it now comes under his management, he at least came in here and looked at this and said, this is. What in the heck is this all covered up for? I mean, my God, nobody can see anything. So he wants to go back to the basic uh, original conception. And I think they're going to try to open, at one time this door was open to the, the arcade, the LAR arcade. And I believe they're going to try to reopen that so this becomes kind of a big circular connection between the arcade and this uh, uh, space here. And a company called uh, Preservation Arts is working on, they're doing sample strips uh, right now, which is why that one tile is slightly cleaned over there. So they're working with different materials and working with him to decide how far the, they could just do a surface cleaning and then leave it as it is. So again, there's always a preservation question about how far do you go back? What's really original? Do you wanna, I mean, in a way the sad thing would be, even Dr. Winter mentioned when I talked to him about the fact that these have been painted, as much as an aficionado he, as he is, he said, well, God, he said, you know, he's been here many times. And he said, they were painted very, very, very well. He said, it's not original, original, but it's what the chocolate shop wanted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so they hired, and he thinks they hired somebody from that shelter, you know, to do this. So he was saying himself it would be kind of sad to lose all the work that that artist did. And he felt it would be appropriate. But how do you get the first coat of shellac off with a solvent without ruining the, the paint? So that's what they're working at now, as to how far to take the restoration uh, back. And Preservation Arts is a very, I've worked with them many times before, and they're a very, very good and very responsible company. Are there yeah. other photographs of the original? You know, it's really kind of funny. Uh, there are some black and whites of maybe three or four pictures, and that seems to be it. And you'd think, and I know I asked Dr. Dr. Winter, uh, did Ernst Batchelder, you would think Batchelder would have had a beautiful, you know, a detailed shot of every single one of these murals, and maybe he did at one time, but nobody seems to, to have those anymore. So there are certain uh, references or magazines, architectural magazines at the time, but it seems like you see the same pictures. There's three or four pictures of black and whites you see over and over again. Like the, um, I don't know if the, the little boy and little girl have been taken down. Are they still up, are they still up there? Yeah, but in a, in a, not in the original position, but they're, right. they're there. Yeah, yeah. There were, there were two counters down here. There was a soda fountain counter as you came in. There was a cashier's counter, which I think they're going to, uh, to work on to restore. And then as you came in there, there was uh, like two low walls about this, this high, all batched on the tile. And they came up in, in kind of a post as you walked into this central area. And there was a little boy and a little girl blowing bubbles. And they're above us now. They've been moved up above this uh, archway. And the bubbles were lights. <clears throat> so they glowed and they were on all the time. So you walked in between the little boy and the little girl would be would be right here. And I believe they're going to try to also uh, you know restore that. So some elements of the interior are on the floor, of course, would have all been tile, would have all been bad shelter tile, probably in warm, you know, creamy, you know, browns of various uh, various shades, kind of similar to the to the wall tile, and uh, and in essence, this can be not with original tile, but the floor can be restored restored very close to its original uh, coloring. Um, so uh, yeah, yes, yes, Linda. Um, in Winters, in Bob Winter's book, he mentions that actually one of his assistants, a female assistant yeah. from, actually did most of the work, and her family researched the Dutch scenes. And her name was, he interviewed her, her sister in 1975, the name was something like Har Harnett, or, I'm wondering if there's any trace, I've been trying to find a trace of, of her, 
her, or I'm wondering if there's any anything known about that assistant. Yeah, about that, that line of the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there is a lady who did a lot of the work. She went to the libraries and chose a lot of the Dutch images directly from books, you know, of, of, of Holland, mm -hmm. and then did a lot of the artistic work or contributed tremendously to the project. I, I'd have to ask Dr. Winter. His, his memory is very, very good, but, you know, he's, God bless him, I, I caught him the other day and he only stayed on the phone for like five minutes and his stamina is so bad. And uh, he says sometimes he either doesn't hear the phone or he just doesn't, just doesn't answer. He says such bad days. But yeah, there was a, there was a, a branch of the family, I, and whether he might know whether there's a connection to the family or her descendants, but I, I don't know. I have to ask Dr. Winter about that. Yeah. They, some artifacts that were removed were stored here in the building. God bless them, they didn't throw everything away. The, the soda fountain that was here had a, had a wonderful uh, lighthouse, a Dutch lighthouse, which probably you know, lit up. And the counter is gone, but I believe they found the lighthouse. And, and I don't know if there's any, I don't think there's any original you know, lighting. Um, you know, the other thing to sort of imagine is this is a, this is a curious kind of space. It, it, you know, it's wonderful, but it can also be, especially because the shellac has gone very dark, it can also be sort of a dungeon. Yeah. So in 1914, you can imagine the lighting would have been, although it's funny in the articles, they were very proud of how good the lighting was for the time. But a standard bulb at that time, you're lucky if it, I, I don't know how many watts it would have given off, you know, 15 watts or 20 watts or something like that. And there were mainly chandeliers. I don't think there was any directional lighting like this, which is wonderful, that there were basically chandeliers in these areas. And uh, those bulbs couldn't have given off very much power at all. After those bulbs comes something called a mogul bulb. A mogul bulb has a very, very large base like this, and it's a great big round thing. But even those are really inferior to what we have today. And I think, and, and, and I just have to theorize, I think once the, the, sh the shop got up and running, the owners of the shop felt that the space was kind of dark. And I think that's one reason they wanted the murals brightened up, you know, and lightened up as much as possible. Because I think day to day with customers coming in, and lighting being in those days very poor, that the space was, I, I think, too dark. And I think that would explain several things about why they went to the, to the, to the expense of having an artist come in and repaint you know, all the murals. Um, and now, of course, we have, now we can enjoy them with, with, with direct lighting and, and uh, very powerful electricity. But in those days, it would have been kind of a dark, dark room. But the, the, obviously, the motif is all Dutch. But in terms of the room itself, this is like a German Ratskeller. Underneath, you know, the city halls of most all the German cities is, a, is a, the, the city Ratskeller's courthouse cellar, uh, but they utilize them as the beer halls, the little beer halls. So the groining that you see here, this kind of architecture, the shape of everything here, the overall design is really like a German Ratskeller, and then the motif is, is Dutch, um, and that's where they got their inspiration you know, from. Don't forget this. this What's that? Yeah, there'd be some, I just don't know. I never saw that, that without... That, that door was that, there used to be a panel there, and that was not open until the, the late 1970s. Yeah, there was another mural there. Yeah. So there wasn't a mural oh. entrance, did No, no. no. The, the, this, this proposed, reopening this proposed entrance, this, this entrance only was punched out in, in the late 1970s. And they took out some tiles? There, there was a panel, and, and the panel is, is in storage. So originally there were 21 panels. I don't remember that. I think there are 20, so there, there's 20 panels up, and this panel is in storage. And, and I hope that this door will be open once it opens, because that's just going to bring traffic for positive public space. I, I think they just want to reopen this to the arcade to get traffic. Because otherwise, if you stop and think, I mean, you walk out on the street, and this is one of the funny things about when I talk about you know, King Ted's tomb, walk out on the street and go to the other sidewalk and just look over here. Now, the original door is gone. There was a very different door out there, but I mean, you know, with all due respect to the building, this has got to be one of the most nondescript <laughs> buildings you've ever saw in your life. You'd walk back this building, you'd never walk through that front door. And you walk through the front door, and my God, you know, this is what is inside here. So in terms of hidden, hidden <coughs> 
many hidden treasures. There's other buildings with magnificent facades and their skyscrapers and there's the Wiltern and the Fine Arts Building and all that. And you know that there's something magnificent that has to be in there. And with all due respect, you'd walk past here <coughs> a million times, you'd never look through that door. <coughs> so it's kind of astounding that so I think with opening up, the concept is if it's open to the arcade, it's going to really help traffic and awareness to sort of open up the space and get people to, and that's the way it was at, at one point, it was open to the arcade. So they're just going to restore that, restore that part of it. Anything else? Okay, here's Richard again. Is this building, is this building still going to be part of the Is this a Is this building still going to be part of our um, I, I think that, that I, I hope it would be open during our walk. It's already, it was open for the last art walk. Oh, it was open for the last art walk? Okay, good. So there you go. Because art walk keeps getting bigger. Art walk only, I know, just like, just like downtown, it just, it all, it's growing. Um, so I think at this point, people should just start looking. Right? Right? Brian's here. Nathan's here. Uh, the chocolate. Oh, there's Alfie. Hi, Alfie. Uh, let's just start looking, okay? And uh, Linda's here to answer questions. Get some flyers at the front. Uh, if you want to sign up to the Lava mailing list, let me know. I'll put you on it. And I want to thank everyone for coming, and we're here to answer questions. And we'll be here until about 12.30, which is another maybe 20 minutes or so. Perfect. And Linda, yes. Postcards. Thank you, Richard. And feel free to take a postcard. This is one of what I hope to be many of the series of the whole uh, home murals. And that's posted on uh, countdowntobadshelter.com. And again, uh, Charles Kibbe of Preservation Arts, uh, of whom uh, Brian was mentioning, he will be here next week in a public discussion, the first of, with Brian to talk about more specifics uh, and the historic context. And, and uh, children. So, thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And we're going to get the, the guitarist back. I, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you.